remain standing. Your Honour, the Administrator, Mr John Hardy and Mrs Hardy, Chief Justice of the High Court of Australia, Chief Justice French and Mrs French, the Attorney General, Mr John Elfrink, the Leader of the Opposition, Mr Michael Gunner, the Australian Minister for Indigenous Affairs, Senator Nigel Scullion, the Lord Mayor, Ms Katrina Fong Lim, judges, partners, magistrates, distinguished guests, family and friends of Trevor, Trevor and Jan Riley and members of the legal profession. On behalf of the Supreme Court, may I extend a very warm welcome to all of you to the ceremonial sittings to farewell Chief Justice Riley. I'm joined on the bench by all of the judges who constitute the Supreme Court. There honours Justice Kelly, Justice Blockland, Justice Barr, Justice Hiley, Justice Martin, Justice Mansfield, Justice Reeves, and Acting Justice Mildred. I extend a special welcome to those who have also joined us on the bench this afternoon. His Honour Chief Justice French, the Honourable Austin Ash, formerly a Chief Justice of this court, the Honourable Brian Frank Martin, formerly a Chief Justice of this court, and the Honourable Sally Thomas, formerly a judge of this court. Chief Justice Riley is retiring on 4 July 2016. Mm. His Honour has made an exceptional contribution to the court and to the community. He has administered justice with diligence, humility and courtesy. To steal a line or two from Montaigne, he's made us all appreciate that on the highest bench in the Territory, we still all sit on our own bottoms. <laughs> Today is an opportunity for the profession and the public to recognise and celebrate Chief Justice Riley's very distinguished career as a Judge and Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. Mr. Attorney General, do you move? Yes, I move, Your Honour. <coughs> Chief Justice of Australia, the Honourable Robert French AC, former Chief, former Chief Justices of the Supreme Court of the Northern Territory, the Honourable Austin Ash AC QC, and the Honourable Brian Frank Martin AO NBE QC, former Justice of the Supreme Court of the Northern Territory, the Honourable Sally Thomas. AC. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I have the rare and great pleasure in paying tribute, tribute to Chief Justice Trevor Riley uh, on this, he's essentially his last sitting of his court as the Chief Justice. I had my solicitor prepare a list of successes and achievements that the Chief Justice uh, had put his name to over his long and distinguished career. And it's true to form, I read that list of achievements and decided it was better for other people who worked in this profession in this court much more intimately, intimately to list them. Because I wanted, in my contribution to this court today, to gauge the man that he was by virtue of the relationship that he and I had built over the last nearly four years as Attorney General and Chief Justice. And in doing so, I want to share a few of the points of contact that the Chief Justice had with myself as the Attorney General and the Government of the Northern Territory. And I have to say at the outset that those points of contact were not always comfortable. 
The first point of contact was that the, on becoming the, term, the Attorney General of the Northern Territory, I was very much aware of the circumstances of juveniles in the dungeons, which are the cells at the base of the local court. Uh, the former Chief Magistrate, Hilary Hannam, uh, who has since uh, gone to the bench in uh, New South Wales, uh, had complained bitterly about those circumstances, and having visited those cells, I could not but more agree. In my desperation as an Attorney General wishing to uh, impress myself upon the need to bear, bring about better outcomes, I went and saw the Chief Justice and suggested briefly, albeit briefly, that this court building could be used for those purposes. <laughs> um, the Chief Justice's portrait hangs outside of this chamber and it has a certain expression. <laughs> it's an expression I am familiar with. <laughs> The fact was is that I wanted to do something and I stormed out of this building and I actually went and sought advice from my solicitor about who owned the building. If it was <laughs> my solicitor, a much wiser man than I will ever be, I suspect, uh, not only uh, gave me my legal advice uh, but also offered me some good political advice in relation to the deal with the Supreme Court. And the reason I raise all of this is that the Chief Justice did all that was necessary to defend his court in the way that he saw fit. However, he also understood what I was trying to do. So as a consequence of that, other arrangements were finally arrived at through a long and difficult road. But the Chief Justice accepted into his court uh, the presence of presence of the Federal Family Court, so that the Family Court building could be vacated to create a new juvenile court here in the Northern Territory. It was a long and difficult road, finally settled, and I'm pleased to report to this court and to the Chief Justice, as he's probably aware, that that Family Court, uh, that uh, Children's Court is now available and is dispensing justice in a much more humane fashion than the dungeons in the lower courts could ever achieve. And I thank you for your courtesy and understanding of what was attempting, that what was being attempted. Your Honours, I also draw attention uh, to another matter which was also raised with the Chief Justice uh, shortly after I became the Attorney General. And I also place on the record uh, my appreciation to Sue Cox in relation to this matter. And that was the matter of a fellow who had been in prison for 24 years, a gentleman by the name of Lazarus Nanabov. Lazarus had committed a grievous crime, there is no doubt about it. He was sentenced to six years and then held over under the more arcane provisions of legislation at the time at essentially the administrator's plea. Governments came, governments went, elections came, elections went, and Lazarus Nabobov had ultimately gotten to the point where he had served 24 years of his six year <coughs> sentence. The decision to release was beyond the reach of this court and lay in the hands of the administrator who naturally would have taken advice from his cabinet. To the Chief Justice's enormous credit, and as well as Sue Cox, the Chief Justice particularly, he raised that issue with me. Because in truth, if you think about what is actually occurring, that when a cabinet finally decides not to release a person because it won't look good, at some point along that journey, that prisoner is no longer being punished. They are taking on the flavour of a political prisoner. And his <clears throat> honour had the courage to raise it with me and insist that something should be done. Whilst I am no champion of uh, Mr Nabobov per se, the law of the reach of the justice has finally reached Mr Nabobov uh, and he has been released uh, and appropriately so. Your Honour, you have also been a strident uh, advocate in relation to the rights of your court. And one of the points of conflict, of course, is the matter of mandatory sentencing. Perhaps you and I will never see eye to eye on such a thing. But I do make this observation, sir, that you have been courageous and steadfast in your position. 
And so as I relate each and every one of these particular points of contact between myself and the Chief Justice, what I'm looking for is a thread, a golden thread, which weaves its way all the way through uh, these points of contact. And that thread is probably the highest compliment I could pay uh, to Your Honour, and that is the thread of integrity. At no point have I noticed or seen the ego of Trevor Riley present. What I have seen is a sense of justice, a sense of right, a sense of purpose, a sense of courage. And that makes your position and time on the bench one that is highly valued by the people of the Northern Territory. There was, if you like, well, there was a gentleman, I should say, a fellow by the name of Szechuan, who described leadership in three words. Humility, clarity, and courage. Humility does not require in leadership to keep yourself to flagellate yourself, but it removes ego from positions of leadership so that you focus on, his, what, on what is important. Clarity, to be able to make yourself understood without any form of ambiguity. And courage, that even when you are in a minority of one, you stand up and you say what you believe. All of those things are present. With particular reference to humility, Your Honour, this has never been about Trevor Wright, but it has certainly been about Your Honour. Thank you. Thank you. The President of the Bar Association, Mr. O'Loughlin, do you move? I'd like to acknowledge that we are on the land of the Larrakia, and I rise to speak on behalf of the barristers of the Northern Territory. This is a significant occasion, and we rightly put on hold the usual business of the court to acknowledge, reflect, and comment on Your Honour's time on the bench as a judge and as Chief Justice. Much has been written about the attributes of a, success, of a successful judge, and they can be stated simply as this. Technical competence or knowledge of the law, practical judgment, <coughs> courtesy, and industry. Your Honour's knowledge of the law is well known and counsel would be foolish to assume otherwise. An unnamed barrister had a rare opportunity to trump Your Honour's te technical expertise once during an early, uh, sorry, during an urgent injunction application just a couple of months ago. That barrister had three hours notice to research and prepare the injunction to obtain orders in respect of a most unusual area of law. <clears throat> the barrister was quite proud of himself for finding, in those few hours of research, an obscure NT Act, the title of which gave no indication of its relevance, but it contained provisions that were directly on point. The court was effectively given only 45 minutes notice, but Your Honour kindly made yourself available to hear the matter. Council thought that he, for once, would be able to inform Your Honour as to what the law was. That moment of glory never came for Council because Your Honour walked into court holding that very act. <laughs> Not knowing whether to feel disappointed or impressed, I settled on both. <laughs> Your Honour's practical judgment and impartiality are well recognised by Council, although on some issues, such as the West Coast Eagles, those excellent, excellent qualities are nowhere to be found. <laughs> Your Honour seriously believe that the Eagles could win last year's grand final. In regards to courtesy, this is Your Honour's day, and I could just say that Your Honour is always courteous. I have no doubt that you were always courteous to jurors and witnesses, but it is known, on occasions, your patience is tested by counsel. We know, or ought know, that Your Honour arrived at the bench well prepared and keen to get to the issue in dispute. Mm. If counsel was similarly prepared, he or she could expect direct questioning on his or her, her case, but this was done with respect and courtesy. On occasions, counsel received very direct and penetrating questions <coughs> from Your Honour, but on this day I would say that it was always well deserved. If one considers preparation as the equivalent of industry or its product, 
then all should know that Your Honour has this attribute in spades. Your Honour's little red book of advocacy emphasises preparation above all else. And it is clear that this is not just Your Honour's mantra, but it is your method. And speaking of the little red book of advocacy, it is but one example of Your Honour giving back to the profession. You have spent countless hours of your time training and helping the young and the not so young advocates. You were a guest lecturer at the NT University and even travelled as far as Bangladesh to teach advocacy. As a leading silk and president of the Bar Association, you still managed to sit on the NTFL tribunal on a Tuesday, Tuesday night, and then on a Thursday night, you would be a volunteer with the Darwin Community Legal Service. Even as a busy Chief Justice, you have been giving your time to so many other causes. You are currently the Vice Chair of the St John Ambulance Australia, and you have been an effective volunteer with this organisation for decades. To this day, Your Honour is giving your time to the National Judicial College of Australia and working with the NT Bar Association, you continue to offer advocacy training to advocates and judicial officers in Tunisia Leste. It is looking likely that you will be providing further advocacy training even after your retirement in Timor Leste. The NTDA has its third biannual conference coming up in July and it's going to be held in Timor Leste. Our very first conference started off on a small scale on Daydream Island with a mere 23 delegates. Without your presence and support, it probably would not have developed into the success that it now is. Outside of court, your Honour has always been approachable and willing to talk to and listen to young and old from a profession. You take a real interest in helping the younger members of the bar develop. And when you speak to the uh, individual, you clearly give your undivided attention. I for one know this because of your habit of punctuating your advice with friendly punches to the arm. <laughs> Justices Kelly and Southwood spoke recently to the profession and confirmed what we all suspected, that your approachability and guidance is also much appreciated by your fellow judges and that it has helped develop a healthy collegiality amongst your brothers and sisters on the bench. I don't know how we know it, but the profession can sense this atmosphere of respect and camaraderie. Justice Mildred, uh, at one of his many farewell ceremonies, <laughs> just a few years ago, spoke of what made him glad to remain a judge until retirement. It was because there is laughter on the, in the corridors of the sixth floor. Your Honour does not necessarily get all credit for this happy situation, but if your contribution increased the odds of our judges walking into court in a cheerful frame of mind, we thank you many times. <laughs> When necessary, Your Honour has been a vocal advocate on the administration of justice. In a composed, diplomatic, but nonetheless direct manner, Your Honour has spoken out on issues such as the adequacy of court facilities, mandatory sentencing, curbing the excess supply of alcohol, and the injustice of the law that forbids the court consideration of Aboriginal customary law. You managed to do this without damaging healthy working relations with other arms of government. William Foster Chambers' longest serving member is their rounds clerk, Graham. Your Honour was probably head of Chambers over 20 years ago when Graham was offered the job. He is here today because Your Honour caused a special invitation to be sent to him personally, and Graham was very proud to receive it. Newer members of Chambers, who only know you as the Chief Justice, were mightily impressed by this thoughtful gesture. Some say that behind every great man is a surprised woman. <laughs> Jan has been your supporter and advisor from well before your judicial appointments. When I think of the advice Jan was always willing to share with me as a new member of William Foster Chambers, covering aspects from accounting, marketing and even self-promotion, it is clear that she has been invaluable to your honour. When counsel does as well as Your Honour has done at the bar and then is appointed to the bench, there is a chance that he may take himself too seriously. This possibility was tested 
on the occasion of one of your honour's significant birthdays, when three friends spotted a garden gnome for sale that had a slight resemblance to your honour. <laughs> the friends, two of whom I believe are here today, one to my right and one to my front, <laughs> thought they could improve on the resemblance with a touch of red paint applied to the hair and the nose. <laughs> While your honour and Jan were away, the three friends snuck into your recently landscaped front yard and, in a discreet location, concreted the noise. <laughs> a lesser man would have taken offence, but word has it your honour allowed the night to stay for a number of years and for all we know, he is still there today. <laughs> your honour has all the attributes of a good judge and you have a few more that make you a good man. We do have a Supreme Court to be proud of, and Your Honour leaves it in good health. May it please the Court. Thank you. Mr Liveris, the President of the Law Society Northern Territory, do you move? May it please the Court. I acknowledge the Larrakia people as the traditional owners of the land on which this Court sits and I pay my respects to Elders past and present and to emerging community leaders. <coughs> it is a great honour for me to address the court today on behalf of the legal profession of the Northern Territory to pay tribute to Your Honour Chief Justice Riley's immense contribution to this court and the administration of justice and to the legacy Your Honour will leave. Your Honour is widely respected and known for your deep commitment to the law and your family. However, the law is a demanding profession, and today I also pay tribute to Jan as a close friend of the legal profession and the remarkable life in the law that she has shared with Your Honour for more than 40 years. Your Honour has had a long and great relationship with the Law Society. The Law Society is proud that Your Honour's name appears in the Council Roll of Honour, Your Honour having served as a Member of Council and as Vice President. Your Honour has a strong sense of community and is interested in people. Your Honour's reputation as a judge is as industrious, wise, incisive and courteous. Your Honour has a quirky bordering on the obsessive love of party pies. <laughs> <laughs> At William Foster Chambers, Your Honour's antics around the party pies at Wednesday lunches are part of folklore. <laughs> Luckily, with your grandchildren's birthday parties to attend in retirement, <laughs> Your Honour not need be troubled about where your next party party comes from. <laughs> Whether the other party goes now have cause for concern about that, so no matter I won't speculate about that. <laughs> Your Honour has generously supported the legal profession and has regularly delivered CPD seminars for the Law Society. Your Honour is the patron of the Territory Chapter of the Hellenic Australian Lawyers Association. Sadly, Your Honour is retiring just as Rileyopolis was starting to become casual. <laughs> Your Honour is a keen supporter of the development of the local profession. At the grassroots, Your Honour is an occasional lecturer at Charles Darwin University and is the patron of the Northern Territory Young Lawyers. As patron, Your Honour has engaged valuably with the newest generation of legal practitioners. Your Honour is a long-term judge and supporter of the Golden Gavel, and hosts lunch and learn seminars. Your Honour discusses with the young lawyers the importance of things like preparation, work-life balance, physical and mental health, and that everyone should be out there running. <laughs> Your Honour is a keen runner and is regularly seen jogging along Bicentennial Park and across Darwin City. And every year during Mental Health Week, Your Honour leads the very popular Chief Justice's Walk for Wellness. The Little Red Book of Advocacy is a collection of articles that were written by Your Honour over a period of years for the Law Society's magazine, Balance. It is the Law Society's first book publication and it has a very special place in the Law Society's history. Over the years, the Little Red Book of Advocacy has obtained a bit of a cult status amongst the profession. It is presented to newly admitted lawyers to this court and it sits as importantly as the rules do on our bookshelves and in our briefcases. The Law Society was extremely proud to launch the second edition at the opening of the legal year this year, which, like the first edition, is dedicated simply for Jan. The Law Society is grateful to Your Honour for the Little Red Book of Advocacy and for the ongoing influence it will have in the profession. 
<coughs> Your Honour has been an egalitarian Chief Justice fit for the times. Your Honour has led with well-measured, assured and confident command. Save and except for when Your Honour has led the Chief Justice of the Levy and out onto the cricket pitch in Norway. <laughs> And that's, I can see that's dangerous territory for me to stray into, since the trophy presently sits up on the sixth floor. But people may draw their own inferences from the fact that Your Honour was unable to take your place in the team last year. <laughs> and not only did it beat the President's 11, but it broke a losing streak. Your Honour has enhanced the court's engagement with the community at large and has thereby fostered greater public understanding and confidence in the judiciary. In 2012, the inaugural Language and the Law Conference was a candid recognition of the critical place that language has in our system of justice and in our diverse multicultural society. The Supreme Court's interpretive protocols were developed out of that first conference and they showed the Northern Territory as the national leader in this area. Like the Law Society's Indigenous Protocols for Lawyers, these protocols are groundbreaking. They will have a lasting impact, not just in the Northern Territory, but all over the country, as courts in other jurisdictions start to adopt similar protocols because they are so important to achieving just outcomes and because they work. Your Honour has been proactive and outspoken about issues such as access to justice, alcohol abuse, domestic violence and mandatory minimum sentencing. Your Honour has described Indigenous disadvantage in the justice system as a tragedy and has made calls against imprisonment as a solution to reduce crime. In 2015, Your Honour described the Federal Government's cuts to legal assistance sector funding as a blow to the heart of the justice system and a false economy and called for real, sustainable and long-term solutions. These types of statements had an influential place in the national campaign that persuaded the Federal Government to reverse many of those funding cuts a campaign that was also supported by the Learned, Learned Attorney General. And this outcome, as well as additional top-up funding from the Territory Government, saved, at least for the moment, frontline services in many practice areas and in the regions, and it meant that they didn't have to close down. Your Honour has led a strong court that has served the people well. In always striving to improve the reach and efficiency of our legal system, Your Honour has challenged the court and the legal profession to keep getting better and to keep going further for the benefit of the entire community. When this sort of ethos is championed by the Chief Justice, as it is by Your Honour, it flows down and it influences all of us who play any part in the administration of justice. As Your Honour departs the court, I thank Your Honour for this on behalf of the legal profession and wish you a fulfilling retirement filled with joy and happiness. May I the court. Thank you. I'm going to say something. Well, thank you, um, His Honour the Administrator and Mrs Hardy, Judges of the Court, former Chief Justices and former Judges of the Court, Magistrates, uh, all distinguished guests, uh, special guests and friends of the Court and of myself. I'm grateful to the many people who have uh, flown in to join this ceremonial event. I'm particularly delighted and honoured to welcome Chief Justice French of the High Court uh, of Australia and Valerie. For those of you who don't know, Chief Justice French will retire early next year. Uh, he has been an outstanding leader of the Australian judiciary and he honours this court with his presence here today. Thank you to the speakers. Uh, thank you, Mr Attorney. I note that uh, you and I will be departing our respective roles at about the same time. Will the system survive without us? <laughs> I expect so. I note that in appointing my successor, your government followed the new judicial appointments protocol. I welcome the announcement that Michael Grant will be the seventh Chief Justice of the Northern Territory. The proposed appointment has met with a claim and the court will be in good hands. Thank you to the President of the Northern Territory Bar Association, Ben O'Loughlin, and to the President of the Law Society, Taz Liveris. Mr Liveris has been kinder than his predecessor, Peggy Cheong. <laughs> if she's here. <laughs> who famously welcomed me with the observation, some may say that your honour is as wise as you are handsome, but I would suggest that your honour is much wiser than that. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> 
I'm not sure it was meant as a compliment. <laughs> You know, for me, the most daunting part of a judge's life is the contemplation of retirement, or more particularly, surviving a ceremony such as this. Uh, the welcoming ceremony at the beginning, beginning of a judicial career is a breeze and a time for anticipation. It's all downhill from there. <laughs> at a farewell ceremony, many things will be said, and some of them will be true. Most of them will be embellished and enhanced beyond recognition. The dreadful thought, however, is that on a day like this, the judge will come in through the door to the court as a rooster, or in my case, as an, has, a, has unkindly been said, a little red rooster, <laughs> and will depart through the very same door as a feather duster, <laughs> suffering, of course, from deprivation of relevance syndrome. On occasions like this, judges, retiring judges, sometimes take the opportunity to reminisce You'll be relieved to know that the judges in the profession courageously and selflessly provided me with that opportunity at a farewell dinner just a few days ago. They did so in order to protect you from the experience. <laughs> I took a full advantage of the opportunity. You should be grateful to those who had to go through it. In an endeavour to reduce the emotional pressure of this occasion, I propose to indulge myself and reverse the usual order of events by saying thank you to a number of people. First, my wife, and I'll say no more, <laughs> and my family, uh, on easier level. I thank my fellow judges who sit with me today. This is a competent and hard-working and collegiate court, and I'm sure the happiest court in Australia. That is all to do with the quality of the people who serve on the court, and I am forever indebted to them for making the fulfilment of my role so easy. In an ideal world, I would be able to individually thank the many people who have assisted, supported and encouraged me over the years. That, of course, is not possible today. However, I must mention some. I would like to thank my personal assistants, all of whom have become friends. Uh, I mention in particular Janice Rowland, who stage managed the ceremony today, and there's a huge number of you here, uh, and I'm very grateful for that. Uh, I would also like to uh, thank Carol Gwinane, who guided me from the bar to the bench, Margaret Babington, who guided me from judge to chief justice, and Emily Arthur, who will guide me out the door. <laughs> I thank my associates, of whom there have been 18 over the years, and many of whom are here today. I have followed their individual careers with interest and pride. The relationship between a judge and an associate is a two-way street. The associate takes the role in order to learn about the law, but at least in my case, the judge also learns much from the associate. I thank those responsible for the effective administration of the court, headed by Greg Shanahan and Chris Cox, and the administrative staff supporting them. I thank the staff of the Civil Registry, both past and present. I thank the Sheriff's officers, led by Daniel McGregor and by court institution, Marion Warren. The court provides a welcoming public face for the court. I also would like to mention Malika O'Keel, who has done much to lift and enhance the positive profile of this court. I wish to thank the members of the legal profession, past and present, for their support and encouragement over the years. The Northern Territory is a place of opportunity, and this is especially so for the legal profession, which of course uh, here is a vital and energetic legal profession. It achieves a lot at a local level, but also at a national level. I have been part of the Northern Territory profession since 1974. I have been shaped by it, encouraged by it, and supported by it. I see the same happening to those who follow behind me. I thank you for your support, both of the Supreme Court and of myself. The list of those who I'd like to thank is obviously exceedingly long, and I must leave it there. This is the part the attorney's been waiting for. The <laughs> least satisfying part of being a judge over the past 17 or so years has been watching the ever-increasing level of incarceration of the Indigenous members of our community. The situation is not getting better. This depressing fact is not something that can be corrected or addressed by the courts. The rates of incarceration in the Northern Territory are high, indeed alarmingly so. 
but are necessary because serious crimes are being committed. Proportionate sentences must be imposed. The courts are at the very end of the process and it is all too late at the time of sentencing. Compelling research has demonstrated that it is not an answer to increase sentences to become ever more punitive. It is not an answer to have mandatory minimum terms of imprisonment, which give a false impression that a government is being tough on crime when, as we all know, mandatory minimum sentences have no impact on rates of crime but, and sadly and inevitably, lead to injustice. Rather, it is social and environmental problems that must be addressed by the whole community and hopefully with effect before the criminal justice system is engaged. It is necessary to confront and rectify the extreme disadvantage experienced by this significant group of people. Generally speaking, we can make an immediate start to reduce crime by effectively addressing one of the significant and immediate causes of crime, which is the abuse of alcohol. My journey in the law has taken me from practising as a solicitor, practising at the independent bar, being appointed a judge of this court and finally the significant privilege of being Chief Justice. I was appointed just in time to host with my fellow judges the centenary of the Supreme Court of the Northern Territory and this was a significant achievement for the Territory and a moment in history well worth celebrating. Mine has been a rewarding journey spread over approximately 45 years, can you believe that? and I'm grateful for the opportunities that came my way. I'm grateful for the substantial trust placed in me. I'm proud to say that the Supreme Court of the Northern Territory is a successful court, providing efficient and impartial justice to the people of the Northern Territory. To be part of that process has been a reward in itself. Thank you for your attendance here today in such great numbers. Uh, I'm truly grateful. Thank you. Mr. Solicitor General, do you move? May I please the court? Mr. Wilde? May I please the court? Uh, President of the Bar Association of South Australia, Mr. Harris? May I please the court? Mr. Tippett? May I please the court? Mr. Karczewski? May I please the court? Mr. Wilde? May I please the court? Mr. Cox? May I please the court? Mr. Reid? May I please the court? Mr. Nathan? May I please Brown. Do the members of the profession also move? Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes this ceremonial sitting. The judges would be pleased if you join us in the foyer of the Supreme Court for refreshments. Please adjourn the court. Silence all stand. God save the Queen.